students that work with us, that's the very first time the opposition has had a very big number and over 90% new members of parliament. So that provided uh, a challenge of uh, a huge magnitude, albeit not insurmountable. So we had had to undertake training and I'm very happy. None of my members, and I've been taking record, all my members have been able to speak in parliament. I don't have a mute member on my side. Nobody has failed to speak. I'm not talking about what they have spoken, but at least everybody has had to say something on behalf of their people. And as the team leader, that makes me feel a sense of, uh, you know, uh, gratitude for, um, uh, on behalf of my members for paying attention and uh, responding to the training we have offered them over the last uh, two years. Of course, one of the things we set out to do, you recollect, at the launch of our legislative agenda, we said we're going to work differently. We're going to take our work to the people. And I'm extremely grateful uh, to my team that we have moved almost more than half of this country length and breadth in uh, undertaking our oversight role. We have been to the north, to the northwest, to the southwest, to the east, to the, uh, to the central, undertaking oversight. And in doing this, we have brought to, to the fore the failure, the critical failure of service delivery in this country, which is our critical role. We have brought to the fore abuse by the regime, abuse of power, abuse of rights, outright theft, outright corruption. Don't forget, for example, that uh, as part of our field excursion, the House two weeks ago passed a motion to investigate the abuse of human rights in the fishing communities in this country. Every place we have gone to in the fishing communities, they have complained about abuse. People have been killed. Property has been stolen by men and women in uniform. This was very intriguing. And as the oppositionalist, we are proud that finally the House of Parliament has recognized the cry of our people and the House is about to begin investigating. I, I talked to the Speaker yesterday. She assured me that uh, before the end of the week, she's going to out terms of reference of the two committees of Parliament, the Committee of Human Rights and Internal Affairs that are going to investigate the abuse of human rights in the fishing communities. This was a key outcome of our field discussions in taking parliament to the people on the opposition to the people. I'm proud that um, we are changing the way we work. We are not armchair opposition, but we go to the people, listen to the people, and best understand their challenges and tribulations. We have brought out critically the failure of service delivery, and I'm very happy with the media. I thank you most sincerely and um, how you brought to light the issues we discovered. The schools that we visited, with the children sitting on logs, you know, and dirty clothing, polythene paper, all sorts of problems, you know, studying under tree shades. We visited hospitals. You saw the kind of suffering visited on our communities and the failure of the health sector. You have seen a road infrastructure crumbling away, and now the regime is uh, fidgeting, saying they're fixing it. I think it's because the opposition in parliament has been proactive in not simply talking about the things, but visited practically and highlighted these issues. The violations, um, land grabbing in the countryside, those of you I traveled with to Luero, in zero way. When we left, if you recollect that village we visited in zero way, where the military, some military men and the Arabs there had taken over the whole village. They have since disappeared because they brought all these issues to bear to the, to the public. 
is because the opposition has been working. The problem is still, of course, big um, of abusing our people on their land and settling them, especially by the powerful, by the regime operatives and the military, abusing our people on their property. The, we visited Chotera where my brother Mpalanyi and uh, one fortunate represent how citizens have been really undermined on their land in the eco pipeline project. Now I'm told they're panicking and going back. But those people have petitioned parliament and I'm very sure the, the duo here are ready to represent their people and present their petition to parliament. The long and short of this is that um, we have been able to, to bring out the issues that affect our people and we have held government accountable on a number of violations and neglect. For example, you are aware we have an impending audit of the Central Forest Reserve, a matter that is still pending. I'm very sure my very able Shadow Minister of Environment, the Honorable, the indefatigable Christine Kaya is ready with that. She's been talking about it over and over. We need to audit environmental degradation in this country, especially the giveaway of the Central Forest Reserve, wherever we have been. These are matters we have brought out. We visit the mining sector, a sector as being mafia-led sectors. No doubt the mafia in charge of fishing, they are also in charge of mining. You saw this week what happened in Kalungu. One of the mafias that were told by the people of Kalungu is terrorizing them. Kalungu East. Um, there is a learning site, I forget the name. Kabunga, Kamunga. Yeah, there is a terrorist called Kawesa. I'm told he was arrested last week with several tons of premature fish. So this is the fellow who's been terrorizing citizens and accusing them of uh, illegal fishing. So he has over 100 boats and several tons of fish, in premature fish, that he's logging and, uh, and selling to DRS and other places. So he's a military man being covered by military men and women and the common people are suffering. I am happy with the opposition because we were able to bring out these people. They were in denial. Now they are hunting each other. Very soon, the thieves will start accusing each other. And we are proud for bringing out that as the opposition. Of course, we, we, have, uh, we, we set out also. One of the most difficult things in parliament is legislation making laws. First of all, very few members of parliament pay attention to lawmaking, partly because of uh, limited knowledge of the process, but also the process is a bit intricate and technical and ends up being boring. I want to congratulate my team uh, for caring for every bill that has come on the floor of parliament the opposition has had a position it has provided. I can mention several legislations that have come. We have offered our view of the law. We have done a bill analysis of every other bill and offered an alternative. This information for those who want to, re to record for posterity is available in print for you to share with the world on how we've been able to put on record all these issues. Of course, not forgetting that uh, a number of my members have their own private members' bills. Uh, people like Dr. Bedibuanika has a bill, the contract farming bill, the Honorable Chiaga has a bill to amend the um, copyright and neighboring rights law. Uh, it's an advanced stage. Honorable Chivumbi is, uh, got leave to amend the Public Finance Management Act and several other colleagues with proposals that we are working on. That for me is a clear testament to the fact that um, our team understood very well uh, what to do and they have embarked on it. I have been here for some time and we have expended the time 
without the opposition even mooting a proposal to amend any law or to provide any law. So this seemingly uh, young and a, a bit novice team has for me scaled the heights in as far as appreciating this duty and undertaking um, to follow up on it. Uh, of course, this uh, wouldn't have been achieved without the very, very able support of uh, our technical team. Every once and again, the technical team of the opposition is changed. Uh, and it takes a bit of time. You see, the work at parliament is not work like any other place. It is very particular, very specific, sometimes intricate, in some cases confusing. But I want to congratulate Peter and the team for a job well done. Uh, the technical team has been working so well. They have provided very critical technical backstopping to these politicians. Politicians are not easy to work with. Um, you don't listen. The, the media can listen. Politicians are not easy people. You want to go and support a one only Mwada, but he thinks he knows what he wants to do. <laughs> he wants to do it differently. You know, I'm using all of Mwada because I know he won't be angry about it. So we are not easy people. So the technical team has been very critical, but we have also trained them. They are a well-trained team, well-oiled to do their work, and I want to thank them for uh, enabling us to this work. Their capacity has been well built, and um, through the benchmarking visit they have uh, undertaken to various jurisdictions with uh, members of parliament, uh, on a number of things, we can speak the same language, which is why in the last financial year, they were able to do something unique, to provide an alternative budget with an approach hitherto and a known to, uh, to, to, to these spaces, what we call the human approach to budgeting. And I'm very sure until we explained its length and breadth, many people were confused as to what the opposition was up to. The country now understands that the budget is not a matter of crumb work, that the budget can be oriented to certain things and make people feel different about the budget and its meaning to them. I want to thank the technical team for being receptive and open to, to change because um, the politicians offer the framework, the benchmark, what they want to be done, and the job of the technical team is to polish that. We speak in raw form, but they have no space and luxury to work in raw form. They have to work in a refined form. So Peter, Dr. Sozi, Dr. Walusimbi, the, the team leaders, I want to congratulate you for making our work possible and smart. I don't think we have ever produced any shabby work. No, it's because we work with um, a very good team and an able team and an able team, which is why um, we're here to thank them for supporting us. And I hope we'll continue doing the same uh, in the next session of parliament because it's not yet Uhuru uh, for us. Invaluably, all this happens with um, a lot of challenges. At the beginning of our term, I was asked what I envisage as the major obstacle to achieving our critical objectives. And I said, and I said today, I re echo the same sentiment that the major handicap to doing our work is that um, the government in power has never appreciated that the opposition exists legitimately and therefore does work backed by the law. A number of times, the opposition is looked at as a bother, a huge bother, and you know, dragging government work in some way. And when that is the sentiment expressed by those with power, authority, authority of resources, authority of coercion, power to coerce, then you have a problem as the opposition. You recollect when we were doing our field work, the Prime Minister of the Republic dared to say 
that I should not go back as if I am Hassan or a subordinate. She did not think, does not believe that the opposition actually has a legal mandate to hold her in check. Of course, we defied her, aware that uh, she was speaking out of turn. The sentiments expressed by the Prime Minister are the sentiments percolating and perforating down the echelons of our government, that the opposition uh, is a, a bother, the opposition is uh, making a work impossible, we should do away with them, you know? The, the, the movement mentality has never vacated um, some mind spaces and it has constrained work. In fact, so many actors, including members of parliament, look at the opposition, as some funny outfit. But I'm glad that over time, part of our work has been education. We have been uh, educating ourselves on our responsibility and also educating our adversaries of our duty. And I think over time, they have appreciated our work. Thanks to my team for being assertive in what they've been doing, because you can only assert yourself to be understood in a certain way, and then your adversary will surrender to your insistence. It's because of the insistence that uh, we've been able to do this work. Is our numerical strength a challenge? Yes, it's a challenge because for a, ho a house of 500 plus members, and you barely have a third of that, is a challenge. So for you to be able to be impactful on what you do, you must raise the threshold of what you do in terms of output. That has been our preoccupation. For you to be able to, uh, to attract the attention of your ad adversary, you must be able to raise the quality of your output. Otherwise, um, if you are few and your output is quara uh, quara, so to speak, then of course you cannot really have the attention of your adversary. Thank you, my team, the political colleagues and the technical team for being able to raise the threshold of our output to the extent that um, we cannot be ignored. It's very difficult. It's almost improbable to ignore the opposition in parliament because we have raised the threshold of our work. Many challenges remain, but the challenges are not insurmountable. We're going to continue pushing what we believe in at this stage in parliament, there are very, very serious issues the House must resolve for posterity. The issues relating to violation of human rights, for me, are the most critical at this stage. If we do not resolve the current impasse, where those with authority are not able to pronounce themselves and come clean of various gross violation of human rights, then any debate of politics does not make sense. Assuming that um, the country is preparing for an election in the next two and a half years, how would you prepare for another activity when problems over the past activity have not been resolved? And this is where we are insistent that um, the opposition in and outside the parliament must find and summon the best of their energy to make sure that these issues are resolved. And nobody should really introduce other issues until these issues are resolved. The issues are definitive of our intentions as leaders. They are defining of our, our legacy as political actors. And they remain in the annals of our history as matters this generation either resolved or cowardly fail to resolve. And I don't think the House of Parliament can act in a cowardly manner and run away from its obligation of ensuring that the history about us will be a history of courage, will be a history of determination because the issues at hand are definitive and will speak to our legacy. I want once again to thank you, the media, for being a part of uh, what we have been doing and continue to do. And I believe that um, when the media does work better, everybody works better. 
as a mirror of the public, the mirror should not be a bloody mirror. The mirror should be clear. The clarity of your reporting, the clarity of your analysis. I, when I say clarity of analysis, uh, one of my friends who is not yet here, in one of our meetings at my parade quarters, in his analysis, he analyzed how I looked at my president and his issue that Mpuga's eyes and that of his president were not looking as friendly as. So I'm only saying that the, the quality of how the media analyzes the issues at hand is very important in shaping how society views the space occupied by politicians in this country. Nobody should do, occupy public space without consequence. And the consequence must be positive consequence. If it's going to be negative, then you have every reason to seek vacation of that space because that space is very critical and consequential. I want to ask of my colleagues from the political wing to never shy away from the media, you know? And also speak to the media when you have knowledge. It's very dangerous for us to speak to the media uh, when we don't have knowledge. But I'm glad uh, many of my colleagues, where they do not know they seek, information before they speak out. It's the reason probably why we have been able to speak to the country with firmness, with authority, and with uh, uh, a direction that seeks to offer public good uh, and echo our chosen motto of accountability and service. And because I said I don't have I don't want this to be a monologue, but I thought I should highlight to you how we've been working and operating so that you, you, you load your guns after listening to me and then fire from all ranges um, without fear or favor. I thank you once again and good morning once again. Thank you so much, Lop. Uh, I think it's a very interesting taking us through of what we have gone through in this year and this is a time for the questions from the media. I would like to welcome all the other members of parliament who have just arrived. I would like to tell you that the Honorable Santa Court is here. She's our Shadow Minister for Regional Affairs, the Honorable Muwada Nkunyinji, our Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honorable uh, Gilbert Ulanya, who is our chairperson uh, for local governments, uh, the Honorable Court, who is the DPG uh, whip, and uh, the rest of the members will be introduced. So I'd like to thank you. We are going to take questions from the media. Before we do that, I would like in a very special way to welcome. I know that the members of the press who are here, who are always part of us, who are under the Uganda Parliamentary Press Association, UPPA, but I would like in a special way to welcome uh, Dick Mvule, an editor from Radio Simba. You're very much welcome. Uh, we used to be with Dick here in UPPA. Uh, you're very welcome and thank you for paying attention to the work of the leader of your position. I'd like to welcome Paul Kayonga from Next Media Services. If you watch Current Affairs, you definitely know or have heard about Paul Kayonga. You're welcome and thank you for paying attention to the work of the Office of the Leader of your position and certainly to Current Affairs. I'd also like to welcome a very special person, uh, Becca Zena. The people who you never watch on TV, you probably never listen to them on radio, but they're behind the most powerful shows on those TV stations. Becca Zena is behind the production of all the current affairs shows on Next Media, Media Services. You're welcome to this event. And, and uh, we will be definitely welcoming many others. Um, we would like to welcome the other members of parliament. I can see the Honorable uh, Karl Wanga, David Luchamuzi, who is the member of parliament for Busuju County in Mitiana district. And he's also our representative uh, to the Commonwealth parliament. Those of you who have questions about the Commonwealth parliament, he's here to respond to that. We would like to welcome the Honorable Nabukera Hanifa, the woman member of parliament for Mokono district. 
She is our shadow minister for human rights. I am very sure that the media is very much interested in the human rights issues pertaining. So she's available to respond to any questions. The Honorable um, Christine Kaya Nachimuero is the woman MP for Chiboga District and our shadow minister for environment, water and environment. Uh, the Honorable Teddy Namboze, you're very welcome. She's our uh, woman member of parliament for Mpiji District. The Honorable um, Etho Betty Naruima is the woman MP for Wachiso District and our shadow minister for local government. I'd like to welcome the Honorable Joel Senyonyi, who is the MP for Nakawa East and our, oh, sorry, West, and our uh, chairperson for Kosase. You're welcome. He's also the spokesperson for the National Unity Platform, the leading opposition party in Uganda. The Honorable Umu Richard is uh, the member of parliament for Mitiana South in Mitiana District. You're welcome. And the deputy whip for the Democratic Party. The Honorable Alan Sebunya is the MP for <laughs> Nakaseke. You're welcome. Uh, I can see a number of people who are very excited about the Honorable Alan. Uh, the Honorable Fortunate Nan Tongo is the woman MP for Chotera District and the Shadow Minister for Gender. You're welcome. Uh, the Honorable John Paul Mpalanyi. <laughs> I can imagine the reason for the clapping. You're all welcome. And we'll be introducing the other members of parliament and members of the Shadow Cabinet as they come in. Ladies and gentlemen, Oh, apologies. Dr. Apio Yunis. Well, uh, you're welcome. Oyam North, uh, she's a UPT member and a member. You're very much welcome. So we will take questions. I introduced Honorable Mwada. Yes. <laughs> it's our foreign affairs uh, shadow cabinet member. So we'll be taking the questions and uh, members of the press, this is what is going to happen. All the shadow cabinet members, okay, not all of them are yet here. Others are on the way. Dr. Bed said is on the way. Dr. Um, Hilderman, Chiaga Hillary is also on the way and many others. So you're going to be asking questions. Sadab Chita Takaya here is going to take around the microphone for whoever wants to ask a question. And you will indicate uh, where you're directing your question. If a question is to the leader of the opposition, he will definitely respond. If you need a response from a particular shadow cabinet member in that particular docket, again, that person will be ready to respond. For those who are not yet here, for those who are not yet here, the shadow cabinet members who are not here, definitely the leader of the opposition will be taking the questions. So you're welcome to ask those questions and we are here to respond to those questions. Thank you. Eh. So I think we'll be taking maybe three, three questions. We'll be taking three questions. They respond and then you ask other questions. You introduce yourself and the media house that you're representing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Uh, my name is Dick Mvule. I'm an editor at Radio Simba. Uh, mine goes to the leader of opposition. Uh, Honorable Mpoga, you realize that uh, there has been a culture in the opposition and uh, you realize that uh, uh, Honebo Latigo handed over to Honebo Nandala Mafabi, Nandala Mafabi handed over to Wafula, Wafula handed over to Ki Winikiza, Winikiza handed over to Honebo Wall, and then you took up the mantle. After two years of, uh, two and a half years, do you see yourself continuing as the lob or you are going to hand over to another person? I know you poked us when you were starting your statement, but I thought I should ask this question without fear or favor. Although you are my friend, I had to come. Then the other question is that, uh, how do you explain the thin ground of your members, the cabinet members? You realize that uh, only a handful are here, although Honorable 
Uh, the spokesperson has said that uh, many are coming, but after two years, this should be a milestone. You know, they should not have an excuse of not being here. How do you explain that? And in the introductions, I've not seen any person being intro being introduced to have represented the party secretariat. Don't they know about this event today? Thank you very much. Morning once again. Uh, my name is Francis Vega. I work for Radio Sapiencia and I'm the lead of opposition in Uganda Parliamentary Press Association. Uh, I was so shocked when my colleague also, the honorable member of Umane Mpiok Bitiana, by not recognizing me. I had him evule, the rest. But that is on a light note. Uh, to start with the point of my colleague, uh, Mivule, uh, the issue of uh, your term, uh, what is that inner feeling in you as this term comes to an end, the term of two and a half years, what does that inner feeling tell you right now as the leader of opposition who's about to, as the term ends? Uh, then the other thing is on the, the personal reflection. What is that turn off point? where you would uh, maybe regret serving under this current regime of NRM as the leader of, of, of opposition. Um, uh, the other question for me uh, is about, um, how do you describe the current political jungle where you serve? Considering all political parties, how do you describe it with the intentions uh, of trying to change the current regime to a democratic way of governance. Um, I'm Delop. Wait, I, I raise my questions, then I sit. Uh, the third point for me uh, will go to the to the report, the recent report on cooperatives. Uh, what is your personal view on the position MPs who are alleged to be on that list? Who are alleged to have embezzled some of the cooperative funds? Uh, then my last point goes to Honorable Joel Senyoni. Uh, how do you feel about the wonderful reports that you make in your committee, the recommendations that you make and later are not put into implementation? Thank you so much. Thank you. I think, Sadeb, we can respond to those questions because they're quite a number. So we'll have the leader of the opposition respond, and then the Honorable Joel Senyonyi will be responding to his uh, question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, the two media personalities that have asked questions. First of all, to, from Mr. Amvole, the opposition culture um, of handing over, that's not a problem. You know, certain norms are written, others are called preemptory norms. Okay, they're not written, but they become a matter of practice. But when they arise, they do not cause adrenaline to rise. And as the leader of the opposition, I, I am part and partial of uh, a political culture we are trying to grow. That when a change happens, it's not a crisis. It only becomes an obligation to uh, an occupant of that public office to do good. And whoever is in office be supported by all and sundry to do their work. It, it is as simple as that. I don't think that should cause any adrenaline. Um, of course, I poked the, 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 the media like you observed. Uh, it was purposeful to... One, to appreciate the fact that um, the, the office has been profiled to a level more than, um, than ever before, that it causes uh, debate when actually the duty to do public good lies with the government. So the media has allowed government to get out with the murder, with the corruption, uh, lack of service, and they paid the attention to the opposition office that has no resources to implement to do services. I think as the editor, 
you question the wisdom of your reporters in laying, uh, in concentrating. I have not seen a debate on failed service delivery by the prime minister and a failure to answer questions in parliament and running all over the place uh, singing a picture as a prime minister instead of uh, looking for services, uh, offering services uh, to the people of Uganda. But I appreciate there are a few members uh, in here. Uh, Mr. Amble, we are dealing with adults. Well, many members communicated they were traveling back from Chigali. I'm human enough to understand that. But also, I can't rule out the fact that some members are already in a holiday mood. But I cannot be a person to compel people to be here. The only person that reached out to me was the chief whip, and he called me rushing home to sort out uh, a family matter, and I can understand that. So when you meet them in the call, you ask them where they were. That is their question, not my question. Uh, nobody from the press secretariat, you, you want to advise us on true invite here? Was that your intention? We did not invite them. It was a media interaction between the officer of the leader of the opposition and the media. I wanted this space to be occupied by members of parliament. That's why you are free to fire at anyone here. When, if my party president was here, it would be about the party president. So we wanted this to be about parliament, the opposition and the parliament and their work. So feel free to fire to them. So when we have space for when we want the party to be involved and discuss intra and extra party issues, we invited them. So I thought this space would best be occupied by the people, the party sent here and obligated. In fact, I'm, I expect you to ask people to account for the obligations to the duties given to them by the party from within NUP and without. So that's why I wanted them to occupy this space. Maybe some of them have even never had occasion to account for their work. So this is their space. Allow them space to, if the Secretary General was here, it would be about him. When will a humble man like Joel get space to speak in the presence of his president? So we, that's why we choose. How will my man from Kagorogoro, Chukuba Mutwe, Kayemba Solo have occasion? to speak to the media in the presence of the president. So sometimes this space is gazetted for humble humans to also speak to the country. Kindly take it in that uh, light. But whenever we do and whatever we do, we are obligated to inform uh, as a matter of respect to the party secretariat. Um, Mr. Francis Rubega from Sapiensha, some of office, what is my inner feeling? I have expressed my inner feeling in my preambles here to you that uh, we have worked, we have not withered, we have worked together. It's not easy to put together a team and that team delivers. We are a six party platform and uh, getting those people to work, these parties are founded on various ideological foundations. They come here with different objectives, but you must figure out a mechanism of filtering those objectives and consolidate them into a workable framework that will speak to the common voice of the opposition. So my inner feeling is that um, we have done a lot, but it's not yet Uhuru. We would have had you know, a sense of deja vu if we'll probably have delivered on our most critical objective of regime change, okay? So I feel um, uh, a sense of pride in how we've been able to consolidate um, the team amidst various challenges, including the regime poking at the opposition Midway, you have some of uh, the opposition party members uh, cross. That's not a small thing. But when they cross, as the leader, you have a duty to 
to, to gather the, the remaining team members to play their role effectively and, uh, and well. So I think deeply that uh, we have worked together amidst serious challenges. Remember, we started this work uh, from a highly controversial, divisive, violent election. So this work began at the backdrop of that. And the country held its breath as whether the opposition, beaten, scattered, battered, violently, will be able to assemble and have a sense of direction. So I'm here to state without a fear of contradiction that uh, we have expressed ourselves well amidst the, these uh, enormous challenges. I hope I have answered you. What is the turn off? What do you mean the turning point or regret observing at the law? I only really regret of not being prime minister. I should have been the prime minister, not the law. If you're asking the regret, because my party won the general election. So the regret was that um, we were not announced. How do you look at me as the prime minister of the republic? Compared to being a law, maybe things have been different. Otherwise, um, I cannot say that I regret being a law. It's a big honor to lead colleagues. It's a very huge responsibility. It's a huge honor. It's also an opportunity to show that actually you have a sense of understanding of this obligation. Okay? And that kind of responsibility, I cannot regret. I cannot regret what, how I have been able to summon my best skills to bear upon this responsibility and how the team has responded to my call, to my direction, to my guidance. Um, I never grew up with any of these MPs. The people began to send them here. They all came as adults. Nobody made 18 at swearing in. They all came as adults. So to be able to consolidate them and have an output for me was a huge responsibility, which I pride in as having executed, even in the face of a lot of challenges that I think are not necessarily insurmountable, but we uh, have tried to do. How would you describe the current jungle? Describe it from all over the opposition, actors, parties. I think it's not the opposition that is in a, a crisis. The country faces uh, some form of uh, existential threat as a nation state. The level at which political actors perceive responsibility is scary. And of course, the rate and the response of uh, political players in the opposition is also a bit disturbing. Because of regime longevity, brutality and intolerance, some layers of the opposition have become a bit ins. Some of our political layers are getting tired and they need a renewal. That's why you hear some people, some political actors, probably have begun subscribing to the regime, either out of lack of direction, either they are a, a, a little, you know, uninspired to, to work differently. It's a huge duty, but all of us are obligated. In the face of um, the civic space, that is being frozen, it becomes a huge obligation on anybody seeking to play a part in this space, to be strong, to self-express, to speak out strongly and make their intentions known. The only problem a political actor can visit on this country is not making their intentions known, to grandstand to appear to be serious, we're not actually acting on seriously. So if you ask me, that's the challenge. And I challenge myself and all that intend to change the direction of this country to realize that we face a very serious challenge after a regime of 40 years to undo 
the evil that has been planted into this country, to kill the seed of intolerance, of corruption, of murder, because the ongoing debate, for example, of human rights violations before, during, and after the 2021 general election, it is an attempt by the ruling party to settle a political score by coercion. It's an attempt to solve the political problem of the country using force. And this the country must reject. All the opposition political actors must understand the breadth of this problem and rise to reject the overtures of the ruling party to settle the political dispute using force. Your last question, the report of cooperatives. Uh, what do you make of the opposition member that we have mentioned? If a member was mentioned as having participated in this corruption, they should face the law. There's only one law in this land. And whoever is mentioned in the report must face the law. If they had no obligation, if there's no questions to answer, the law is sorted. Do you want me to, to write another report? The report is a public document. So I, 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 I do not have anything to, to sympathize or unless people should face the law, if they have questions to answer, they must answer them. Corruption is person to holder. Okay? It's not institutional that somebody is doing so for the benefit of their community. So that and the other reports before parliament where individuals have been implicated or indicted, they must face the law to the letter. I hope I've responded to the first uh, set of questions. Mr. Chitata, would you want to? Hello, and uh, we'll have the Honorable Joel Senyonyi now. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, to respond to his question. He's about... going to come here. But... Yeah, yeah, he's going to come there. Yeah. This is your platform. Thank you, Lop. The question for me was, um, how do I feel when we do the work that we do, put together reports, and they are not acted upon? I don't get surprised. I don't. Um, I actually get pleasantly surprised when sometimes there is some little action that is taken. That's when it is surprising. And that's what society has become, that when something good is done, you're surprised. For example, when we inquired into Uganda Railways Corporation, produced a report, uh, 48 billion shillings that was abscatulated with the locomotives deal, a fake locomotives deal, we recommended that these people be fired and be prosecuted. Um, the MD and the board were fired, but we have been waiting for prosecution. So they only implemented part of our recommendations because that's a lot of money. It's not enough to get somebody out of their office. We want action. We investigated Uganda Land Commission. We found that um, titles were forged and people were paid billions of shillings. We successfully got some of those titles cancelled, but the money has not been reimbursed because we are saying the titles should be cancelled. These people must return that money because they got it fraudulently. So that has yet to happen. So you see that even when some recommendations are acted upon, it's only partial. Recently, we handled UNBS, and you saw the road we unearthed, and we said, no, these people must be fired. Some have been fired, including the MD, but we are waiting for prosecution, because as you saw, charges were being withdrawn and, and that kind of thing. So even when action gets to be taken, it's only partial. And yet there's a litany of other issues that we unearth and not much gets to be done. And you see, my insistence has always been this work that we do, because I do hear some say these senyonis, the opposition people, they want to make government look bad. 70% of the members on my committee, Kosase, are actually NRM members. When we produce these reports, 
and we table them on the floor of parliament. One, all our reports, and we have had several reports, there's been no minority report. Number two, for all the reports that make their way to the floor, because as you know, some, for many reasons, don't make their way to the floor, even when they are there. But all those that do, they have been unanimously adopted by the whole house. So that, that, that's not my report anymore. It's a report of parliament. And we have been saying, can we begin to take action if we are serious about corruption? My appeal to the leadership of parliament has been and continues to be that let's begin to dig in our heels as parliament and insist that action gets to be taken on our recommendations as parliament. That way parliament will begin to be taken seriously. Because if we don't do that and use the stick that we have, and the stick we have as parliament is the appropriation stick. So if we say entity X, this and this happened, we want action A, B, C, D taken, when they don't take that action and they return during the budget process, like we are now in the budget process, when they return for appropriation, we should not release money to those entities until our recommendations have been acted upon. That's the only way parliament will be taken seriously. But once we don't do that, we'll not be taken seriously. And that's why parliament can censure a minister and she will still come and sit on the front bench. In other words, saying, to hell with you guys. Why? Because we have not dug in our heels and taken ourselves seriously. So that's the appeal that I have always made and still make to parliament and the leadership that we need to be taken serious ourselves by insisting on, on action to be taken. Yeah. So that, that, that's just the situation that happens. But otherwise, we unearth many of these things. You, the media, you have always covered. You saw when we were handling Uganda, Uganda Civil Aviation Authority and uh, all the airport issues there on the famous Uganda Airlines, you all know what happened to that report with all the mess there was. Yeah, and uh, recently I saw Uganda Airlines has made a lot more losses than they have in the past years. Because if you don't fix these issues, the entity will not thrive. These are not issues of NRM, opposition. No, these are issues about the country. One of the things we discovered about Uganda Airlines is people were recycling tickets. You buy a ticket, for a Dubai trip, for example, some of these regular flyers, and the person uses that same ticket 10 times. Yeah, but you guys were there when we were covering these things. And it is in our report, which was denied audience on the floor. So people were recycling tickets because they were in cahoots with some of the managers. So the ticket is not closed in the system. So you use it over 10 times. How do you expect not to make losses? They were buying fuel through a middleman. The real source told us, well, for us, we have no problem selling directly to Uganda Airlines. But if they don't want to buy from us, they want to buy from a middleman who has bought from us, that's their problem. So the middleman buys and then sells to Uganda Airlines about twice as much the price. And you later discovered who the middleman was. The very managers created this and, and many other issues. Yeah. So if you don't fix these issues, and you think you're punishing Joel Senyonyi, you're punishing yourself. And I can say that for all these other entities that we inquired into. Um, you saw with KCCA, they wanted to purchase 10 acres of land at $100 million. That's 370 billion. Meaning each acre to cost 37 billion to put traders. Even in Dubai, an acre does not cost that. And I saw them coming back to parliament saying, you know, uh, please avail this money to KCCA and so on. What is wrong is wrong. Yeah. Um, and then several others. I'll not take too much time, but uh, the direct response is we don't get surprised when action is not taken, but we need to keep insisting as parliament that action gets to be taken. If we are serious about this phrase of zero tolerance to corruption, then let's take action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Joel Senyoni. The chairperson, of course, and uh, we are going into another set of questions. I would like to welcome the Honorable Hassan Chirumira, the Member of Parliament for Katikamu South, the Deputy Imam of Parliament, and also our representative to the IOC. We would like to welcome the Honorable Abed Buanika, the Member of Parliament for Chibanya Kawonera in Masaka City, and uh, our Shadow Minister of Agriculture. You're welcome. 
would like to welcome the Honorable Hilary Chiaga, Dr. Hilderman, Maokota North, and our Shadow Minister for Arts and Culture. I would like to welcome the Honorable Aloysius Mokasa, the MP for Rubaga South. You're very welcome. I would also like to welcome the Honorable Stephen Sirubula, uh, who is the Member of Parliament for Rugazi Municipality. You're welcome. And I would like to welcome the Honorable Kayemba Solo, the Member of Parliament for Kaman Simbi South. He is our Shadow Minister for Sports. I don't know if he will be able to speak English today. He says the LOP normally has his English, and the LOP has spoken most of it today, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, the Honorable Lucy Akelo, uh, Vice Chairperson Kosase, is here from the Forum for Democratic Change. And I can see the Honorable Alan Sewanyana is also, he actually came much earlier, so he's here with us. You're welcome. Uh, we should go into the other session of the questions. I will be welcoming more members of parliament as they come in. Thank you. Sadam, please. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Kayonga. I work with NBS Television. I have a few questions to the leader of the opposition. Uh, Tiwa, you are supposed to keep the Prime Minister in cross-check. How do you rate your immediate uh, recent relationship with the leader of government business on the floor of parliament? And what is the way forward? Another question is, uh, the opposition in parliament has come under a lot of pressure and squeezing more than maybe ever before, I don't know. Uh, do you consider this criticism and pressure justified, especially to you as an individual or your team as a group? And uh, how do you evaluate the relationship between the opposition in parliament and actors outside parliament, actors like in the civil society, rich, uh, uh, religious leaders and others? in as far as the opposition operations are, are concerned. Uh, another question is, what is the most important activity you should start with in a new session of uh, the term in parliament, bearing in mind what has happened in the last two and a half years? Uh, Ebi buzevyo, obi jemuru na wudu, obi semuru ema okota. Engeli jetoli kuflaya parlamenti, abama senge jiba soro bifu na wudu unji. Do you think we should uh, first respond to those? Or... Oh, okay. So that, those were many questions, about four of them. He needs to respond to those and then other people ask. I would request you members of the press, if someone has asked a question and you think that was your question, because of time to not ask again unless you need a clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul Kayonga for that litany of questions. Your, your gun was there loaded. Uh, first of all, the first question uh, how do I you rate, evaluate the prime minister and how will he relate? Um, first of all, the role of the prime minister and that of the head of the opposition are well articulated in the law and practice. And these roles have not changed. Probably what is confusing in our jurisdiction that the, the flamers of our law and the common practice in parliament, there was an attempt to mimic a parliament like um, um, the British parliament which is basically uh, not presidential 
And therefore, the prime minister has the last word on every matter. And because ours is not, is probably quasi presidential, half presidential, half parliamentary, these roles tend to be mixed up. And I can understand why many a time the premise of the public looks to be on sevens and nines on the issues in parliament. And I can't blame her. To be particular, I hesitate to attack her individuals. I don't know how to rate her because she has since run away from parliament. I have not seen her in a very long time. When she comes, she moves in briefly and runs away. So I thought she would have the strength to face me and answer my questions. But we have not had a good occasion for, for me to rate her. So I don't know her abilities yet since she ran away from parliament. I've not seen her in a long while. Uh, ever since we demanded the Chibalama from her. She ran away with Chibalama's blood on her hands. She has not appeared again. But to be precise, that office is very important. And uh, in jurisdictions where the prime minister has the last word, how you answer questions in parliament is definitive of your work as the prime minister. But in our case, because it's a mixed arrangement, quasi-presidential, quasi-parliamentary, the prime minister can run away without answering questions. Sometime in August, I tabled a litany of 50 unanswered questions by the prime minister and her ministers. Failure to answer 50 questions from parliament, I don't think is a credit to any prime minister. If the Prime Minister cannot answer and she cannot pretend over her ministers to answer, I don't know how to grade that. I don't know how to call that. For lack of superlatives, probably the media has better flowery language to describe that. Uh, but in my space, I actually do not know what she does on a daily basis. I don't know whether that answers you. It's a wide ranging question. And I really, with due respect to the Honorable Prime Minister, she needs to be available in the Parliament. And she needs to be capacitated. And I'm using the word capacitated purposefully to come and respond to questions raised by members. I have seen, for example, on a number of occasions, the presiding officers struggling to cover up for the Prime Minister struggling to answer questions that are supposed to be answered by ministers. I have seen the speakers trying to answer for the prime minister. That's not acceptable. The prime minister should have that capacity. If he doesn't have it, she, can, she must be capacitated by her technical team, by her colleagues, the ministers, to respond to questions raised by parliament. Because it frustrates parliament and the work of members of parliament when their questions cannot be answered. And the prime minister is surely responsible. Mr. Kayonga, ask the prime minister to hold a media conference like this one to answer your questions. I don't know why they don't. They should appear and answer questions. Parliament is not responsible for her work. Under the doctrine of separation of powers, the presiding officers have no locus answering for the prime minister. They should be able, the prime minister should be able to respond to members' questions. So the, the last session leaves several unanswered questions. Hopefully we shall follow them up in the um, coming session. The opposition has been under scrutiny immensely. Do you find fair, justified? How do you evaluate this? Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, the pressure. I said this um, briefly in my preamble that this office has been under scrutiny and we do not take offense for that scrutiny. 
it is a testimony to public expectation of the opposition because the opposition posits possibilities for the country to be better and therefore we should have a follow up of what we postulate and um, the scrutiny hel helps us to be better and also uh, to, to look into our own internal abilities our um, priorities as the opposition how we deploy our troops how we we, we prioritize the work on the floor in the shadow cabinet in the committees that we lead the scrutiny is about that, and we do not really take it as offensive. We consider it as uh, a matter that elevates our work to serious work of this nation. And I want to invite the media not to relent on that scrutiny. It makes us better citizens and better leaders of our common peoples. Whether it comes, of course, sometimes um, I have seen criticism uh, informed by lack of information. And I've raised, asked the media, that if you have a void of information, the law has never shied away from facing the media to answer to questions. As a matter of clarifying gray areas, uh, misinformed positions, propositions, including rumors. Because public space cannot be a space of rumors. It must be a space of utmost clarity. That is what we are here for. So I want to invite you to to find it fair enough to interact with us. I, I have had um, a very good relationship with uh, the media and we we believe it's very okay. Mr. Chitata and the Honorable Joyce have been extremely helpful, probably because of their knowledge of how the media works and probably how the media can shortchange public debate to a certain way, they have that knowledge. Uh, whether deliberately or unknowingly, the media is so critical in shaping public debate. That's why the media can shape debate away from government failure to offer the leader of the opposition. It's that critical. That it can change the, the information away. We are discussing gross violation of human rights, and the media picks when is the opposite term ending when we are demanding for missing persons, people detained without trial for several months. That's how important the media is, that you can choose the nature of debate away from critical issues to a person. You know, it's very, very critical and respect the media for that because they can shape debate. Of course, uh, Paul, certain forms of criticism do not come from mainstream media. They come from pseudo media. We have uh, an emergence of pseudo media where there's no editor, where the sources are not disclosed, but pure blackmail. Of course, we have had to deal with the blackmail intended and uh, ignorantly premised. It's also part, we must align, and I invite colleagues to align themselves to get to understand the emergency of uh, informal media and how it can be used to pedal blackmail that can actually uh, you know, get you off your seat and preoccupies you. I think I have been trying to orient my colleagues to grow a second layer of skin to simply do the right thing. Even when uh, there's blackmail flying all over the space, because at the end of the day, we shall not be held accountable for the blackmail, but for the public duty, the huge public duty to which we are answerable for the citizenry. Um, how do you relate with um, actors in civil society um, and other entities? I must say, you know, in 2022, I authored a wide-ranging document, which was a statement that the law on the floor parliament on the shrinking civic space in the country. And uh, one of the key tenets of that statement was that um, civil society has been muzzled. Remember when the gave packed and left. That was a turning point in the work of non-state actors, non-government actors, including media. I am aware of private media 
actors that closed at the departure of DGF. And so many uh, media practitioners rendered unemployed because of that. That was a message sent to civil society to behave themselves, in other words. And that's why in that document, I make out a clarion call to all and sundry to rise and defend public space. It is that that has in a way constrained how would have loved to work with civil society and other non-state actors. I am not saying that they have been compromised, but they have been rendered to go into a corner of survival. And somebody fighting for survival is unable to fight a state. When people go into the, the survival rung, they become disempowered to act on so many things. We have been reaching out to civil society in a, a lot of our, our off-site trainings that have been active, but we still want to see more. We want to see the civil society. We want to see religious institutions, cultural institutions, joined on the platform to fight for this civic space. Free media. The media has been involved in self-censorship because of fear of reprisal from the regime. You know how um, the NGO Act has been dangled to stifle space for uh, NGOs and how uh, UCC has been weaponized to weaken private media. So these are very, very compelling issues. They constrain the way we would have loved to roll out with um, uh, non-state actors. Uh, they are, we have received messages of support from NGOs, civil society, especially those that are involved in the governance. We want to do more. But of course, the opposition has an obligation to roll out a program that these non-state actors will follow. Our programs themselves are a motivator, already motivator, of how these non-state actors work. We need to do better and more to enjoin them in potentially non-dangerous activities. So many NGOs are paper tigers. If you ask them to write, they'll write. And if you ask them to practically get involved, that, that's probably a big asking. They may not participate. You may have to look out for non-dangerous activities in which they will comfortably participate. And then the political actors may roll out into the dangerous market waters. But there's a lot to do. Finally, you did ask um, what would be the most important activity to roll out in the coming year. Nothing is less important. But what is most important is the sanctity of human life. Over the last two months, if you recollect, my first statement in the 11th parliament, when we were still sitting in the tent, my first statement officially on record was a statement of 432 missing persons. Effectively, we are where we started from. It was my first statement. We are still where we started from. From 432, we are now looking for 18 missing persons. Of course, the media has covered variously how they, they, they are close to 300 plus reappeared. Those detained for several months, dumped with broken limbs, dumped with wounds, you know. Several have been dropped. There are others in jail. The opposition in and outside the parliament cannot prioritize anything else without fighting for the right to belong, the right to associate. The political prisoners, as we know them, those in the court martial and other um, uh, courts on fictitious charges, these are prisoners of conscience. And they're there simply because they dared the status quo. That should be the starting point everywhere, not even next year. It's part of what we are here to rally the country for. I expect this to be the cry call on Christmas Day or New Year's Day by 
whoever cares about humanity and the future of this country. So this will be very, very important. Just imagine, Paul, that um, if we, we leave this alone and we know the genesis of this, that this was engendered by an attempt at power grab by the regime to really scare people from associating. And then the following day, we are busy conversing support for the next election without putting this to an end. We must put this to an end. We must compel all actors to respect the right to associate to respect pluralism, that we can never be the same people, that people hold different views and those views must be respected, whether they favor us or not. This we must assert ourselves upon. And then the other issues will follow, like electoral reforms and the rest, as long as there is general appreciation of the fact that we are a pluralistic nation and therefore the various views must be respected regardless. I Thank you, that. Right Honorable Lop. And uh, I'd like to propose that the Luganda version be given in a summary at the end of uh, the English. I think that will be uh, work. So I'd like to welcome the Honorable Joab Businj Awoli. Uh, he's the MP for Masindi Municipality. You're welcome. I'd also like to welcome, I have seen Dr. Bianca Tonda, who is the workers MP. Oh, yes, he's around. You're welcome. Uh, we are very pleased to see you. Uh, I would like to welcome the Honorable Okin Pipi Ojara from Chua West. Thank you for coming. I will go into another set of questions. Please keep them short, precise, to the point. And if someone has asked the question, kindly, kindly don't repeat. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my, Arthur, my name is Arthur Wadero. I write for the Daily Monitor, commonly known as the Bad Paper. Uh, I... Uh, I have three questions. One is uh, to do with uh, the electoral reforms. Uh, around June, your office convened in Monyonyo and a number of things were put to the audience. Discussions came up. And I, if I, you will correct me if I'm wrong, I remember at the end of the session, there was a promise that there would be teams going around the country to collect opinions and voices of those that had not had the chance to convene in Monyonyo, so that would get a comprehensive uh, position on that. So my question is, what is the update as far as electoral reforms are concerned? The second question is to do with unity, solidarity in your camp. Uh, on several occasions, your office has had uh, boycotts for example, in the, in the House plenary, and there have been observations that some members still walk in, attend plenary, even when the other members have voted to stay away. I don't know what you make of that. You may have hinted on that, but my specific uh, question is, what is your specific response or comment on that? And then the third question is, yes, you stated it in passing, but... Um, Yes, throughout the two and a half years, there are a number of things, so many of them, the successes that you've registered under your office. But from where you sit, what are those major ones? Maybe maybe five or three that you really look back and say, those were really pronounced as far as uh, my office is concerned to the people. And if I should be specific in terms of uh, maybe tangible or very very, very specific successes. Yes, I ask this because on several occasions, your office has put question to, questions to, to the side of government, pressing questions, and most of them either there have been responses and either there have been promises to respond. So my question is, from where you sit, what are those major ones? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for according me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Didan Kimathi, and uh, New Vision is uh, where I work. Uh, we've taken uh, concern of your uh, taken concern of what you raised, and we shall do better. That's our promise. But straight to the point. Um, Personally, 
Uh, I would like you to just give me a fitting description of uh, this building in which we are. Is it uh, should we say that it is doing the job as it ought to be that, that as it as it should as it's supposed to be doing like this whole parliamentary institution? Is it playing its part? Is it captured? Is it washed down? Oh, it has been shortchanged. The reason I'm saying this is because the street, uh, the voices on the street differ from those in the uh, in this house. We've uh, recently seen uh, a number of sleek cars, you know, getting distributed, and uh, people out there asking themselves, "Yes, you've put the questions to government, and it's not responding." It's like the other side only responds to those it needs. It doesn't pro uh, respond to the concerns of the citizens. Uh, perhaps if you could talk about the whole essence of having this entire institution called the parliament and whether it is still playing its cardinal role. Didan, please, thank you. Uh, actually, Honorable Joel has answered part of that, but it's okay. Any other question? Please precise, kindly. Thank you so much. My name is Hasif. I work with BBS TV. Um, the Honorable, thank you so much. Um, we all remember that sometime in uh, July last year, we had uh, scandals of, of the 40 million bribe that, you know, uh, some members of parliament and allegations received this money and some returned, some went silent. Of recent, we just heard from uh, the president of the National Unity Platform, who is your boss, uh, throwing light on on the hundred million bribe that uh, is yet or some have even received under allegation. I don't know uh, the issue of corruption. You you highlighted on it, but I need more 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 on that. Is is it a question of credibility, trust? Have you uh, mentored them well in terms of what to do and what not to do? And then number two, we've had some corridor conversation uh, that. Uh, there are discussions, of course, it has been happening that uh, leaders of opposition are changed. Have you, according to what you had planned, is it a job well done or you still need a second half? After that, the lock will respond, and then we have, I think, a final one. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Teopista Nakamia. I write for Bokede. Uh, Lop, what is your message to the new Lop if you're not uh, reappointed? Thank you. Yes, the LOP can respond to those. And uh, after that, we'll have the final round of the questions and the LOP will go into Luganda. I would like to welcome in a very special way also, Mr. Nsubuga Alex. Mr. Nsubuga Alex is the chief news editor, CBS FM 88.8. You're welcome. And I'd like to also welcome uh, Ms. Nalubwama Anit, deputy news editor, CBS. You are welcome. Butuazirunda. Mr. Katavida Daniel, uh, Deputy News Editor, CBS, you're all welcome and thank you so much for the support. You're welcome, Lop, to respond to those questions. Thank you. You know, that's why this uh, interaction is very, very useful. And uh, politicians must live for this and more. If you're not able to, to position yourself to be able to respond to this, then probably you go home or quarter in any or what tens It as if as that. We occupy this public space to respond to controversial issues that arise in our midst because we are supposed to offer public solutions. Mr. Wedulo from the Bill Monitor, um, electoral reforms, what's the update? First of all, you have the wrong record about what we elected to do. At the departure from Onyonyo, the major resolution was that the opposition was not ready to jointly go 
for these consultations. But every political party was mandated to go and undertake internal consultations on what is to be done. That was the major. And, um, I, and I made the communication, I remember that evening. What needs to be done by the opposition jointly and severally to find space and time and consider whether the opposition will be part of the next election or whether the opposition seeks to go in the next election with the same legal regime and the same uh, electoral laws and the constitution. Because in our conversation that day, over the space of two days, there was unanimity to the fact that we have a faulty legal framework that it cannot midwife a free and fair electoral process. And therefore, it required a surgery. And that surgery is what the parties were uniquely tasked to go and look at. Probably look for a surgeon and all the attendant support that will do it. But for us to be able to do that, we also elected to go and try to rally internal ourselves, try to close the fissures, the intra fissures, the gaps within the operations of the individual parties that would easily undermine a run, an attempt to uh, undertake meaningful reforms. What I can speak without contradiction is that it will be suicidal for the opposition to plan to go for the next election without meaningful constitutional and electoral reforms. I personally contend that we no longer have a valid constitution. The 1995 constitution and what it portends today are two different things. For instance, any constitutional lawyer will tell you that in 1995 at promulgation, that constitution was predicated. The predicate was a two-term president, which is why the president in the constitution was given a lot of powers. And the feeling was that even if you are powerful, you after all go after two terms. So when you migrate the two terms, that's a new constitution. And therefore, it does no longer represent the consensus of the people. A constitution is a people's consensus. And a migration from the basic tenets, including term limits, it means you have enacted a new constitution. And that constitution is immensely disputed, which is why the country should have occasion to have a debate on a new consensus, evolve a new constitutional framework, that can speak to the aspirations of the people. That for me is very critical. The opposition to go back to an election with its commission constituted in the same way, with the wide-ranging powers to do what they do will be an act of neglect by the opposition. So I, I believe the opposition needs to quicken whatever is inhibiting us from talking about constitutional and electoral reforms. Uh, I know so many of us in the opposition have misgivings in elections, but if you believe that the elections are part of the framework to highlight and bring to bear enough pressure on the regime to climb down their high horse, and undertake reforms, then invariably we must be the one who's leading the pressure. I hesitate seeing Honorable Mao bringing his own reforms. The question will be, what does the opposition want? So we must be able to in time articulate what you want to be done and put enough pressure, visit enough pressure on all systems of the state, on all actors to participate in undertaking meaningful reforms that will put the country on a trajectory of a durable constitutional order. That's my view. Um,
unity, solidarity in the camp. Some members come, go to the house, others don't go when there's a boycott. Mr. Wedro, I said earlier on that um, the opposition is a six party platform. And uh, all these parties are built on unique ideological platforms. But what we try to do, what the Office of the Law tries to do is to bring all these forces together, make the best out of them so that they are not competing but contending forces. And in con being containing forces, they should find a mechanism of building a, a solidarity beyond the rhetoric of their individual parties, but see through the desire to work. You see, in the opposition, we disagree on a number of things on approach, but we are not disagreeable to the fact that this country needs to make a 360 degrees turn. And that should be what should bind us as the opposition. Of course, speaking fast forward in uh, the fact that uh, section of the opposition go back even when we have a boycott, I think that question should be put to those who go back. What is their motivation? What do they see differently from those who stay out? When So if we go out because of human rights violations, because of the violence that was visited on the population in the last election. And some other party in the opposition believes that that is really a small matter. They should be asked, what would be their view of this? I have heard people say, okay, why don't you simply go back and speak about this? Boycotting the house is part of our speaking. We speak with our bodies and our mouth. So in some cases, we boycott. In other cases, we go and speak strongly and demand for answers. But don't forget that um, some of our political parties, especially their leaders, I will speak about their leaders. I think I'll be unfair to the members to generalize them. Some party leaders have elected to work with the ruling party. And I believe they have been cajoling and convincing their members to throw the line. But I am happy majority members have elected to move with uh, the consensus of the opposition in parliament. The rest of those who choose to work with the ruling party, I think they have a space to explain themselves. But our job, which is no mean fit, is to keep the opposition together amidst the enormity of challenges that they face. You see, I normally tell colleagues that these corridors are very intricate corridors. When you get in here, that's when you get to learn how challenging it is to be in parliament, but also keep your head high and straight. And you'll be able to speak to the public without being, you know, jeered. It's not easy. I suppose that some Members get here or got here and got confused a bit. And a lot needs to be done to ground members in their beliefs, to ground members in the objectives. There is a joint object. Parties have a multiplicity of objectives, but there is a joint objective of the opposition, which all of us must cultivate towards. That, that, that's my view in the circumstances. Um... What are the measures over the last two and a half years? I think we have spoken a, a lot about that. I've even written. There's a whole booklet about that. I have not had occasion to rank them. But if you want to rank them, start with this one today. It is a, a huge achievement to accept to be scrutinized publicly. Many people would rather stay away from public scrutiny. We believe it's a huge duty to be publicly accountable. That even when we make mistakes, we should be able to accept that there was a mistake on our part and seek new direction. For me, as the opposition, it's been a very, very serious matter. But to really probably warm your spirit, we have worked differently 
probably have never seen the opposition in the countryside trying to relate to the people and bring out the failure of governance and the failure of government promises. You have seen regime operatives running up and down like headless chickens over how we work as the opposition. Of course, my members have moved so many motions. We have enlisted some of them. I am sure my Shadow Minister for Law Government is very proud. The Honorable Nalima, she moved a motion that changed the way the PFMA is implemented to allow local governments to retain their funds. You've had local governments very happy that this financial they received an extra one billion to construct roads. That was the opposition trying to help service delivery. Actually, we did that after our country visits. We said we need to do something differently. Those are measures. We caused the Jagal investigation and saved the hemorrhage of taxpayers' money. I mean, we have done this. We have initiated so many of the things. There are so many they are written. Uh, because I hesitate to try and trumpet small gains. Some of these are duties. And we do not intend to put flowers atop of them because they represent our duty as the opposition. And when we make these small gains, there must be the stepping ground for the opposition to even work more, not to move around just stamping for small gains. So that's why I have not had occasion to rank what we do. But probably the public out there is able to appreciate and uh, rank what they think. You see, if you sampled out there, everybody has their favorite, you know? So maybe on another day, I'll ask my team to rank it or even ask the media to opinion poll it. It will be probably a better approach. But in uh, all said and done, my sense is that um, amidst enormous tribulations, we've been able to direct the entire lights of the country towards what the opposition is doing. I think that is a major. Forget about what was about. For good or worse, the opposition is pile driving the national agenda. And we cannot relent on that. Didan, my good friend. What the fitting description of this building and what it does. I wish I was a poet. I would have found the right, you know, phrases, idioms to describe parliament. But rather settle for what parliaments are for. And no parliament works like the other. Parliaments differ. And in our space, part of the reason why there's no comparison is because you don't have the same actors. Just imagine the fact that um, uh, if there's an election of some sort, probably you not see 85% of MPs in the next parliament. That attrition rate alone brings with it all issues, character, motivation, appetite, mention it. So therefore you cannot do a proper comparison of how these parliaments work. You can only baseline it on the duties of parliament. And uh, I hastily say that it's not yet Uhuru for parliament. There's a lot to do, but part of it is how people come to parliament. So you have people here who were never erected by people. So you have members of parliament who were sworn in, but they were never erected. They just found themselves here, occupying a space, but they have no public mandate. They don't feel obligated to act to the prudency. I don't know how to rank how they work. I, I have a duty to remind, to mentor, to supervise my members on how they work. I have tried, but these are adults. Most importantly, what you do, how you do it, is a matter of personal probity. A litany of 
rules, um, the objectives of our parties can be really written and given to you. They can even form the screenshot of your phone. But your actions are definitive of your personal property as an individual. I think parliament has to do a lot to undertake a redemption of the collective. In parliament, unlike cabinet, there is no collective responsibility. But you, you can also say there's no collective guilt. Every member of parliament must account for their personal actions. Of course, the party, because you come under a party umbrella, the party has a duty to align you to its objectives. And that's not a duty you can delegate. As a leader in the NUP, I contend we have tried to guide our people. Many of our members are new. They had to learn how to navigate the intricate corridors of power where we live every day. I told them that, uh, in our, now in our meeting, I told them that these corridors you see are very small, but they can carry a trailer. You know, a trailer can move through those corridors. That's how equally small and big they are. And therefore, when you're moving, you must take care of your movements and where you sit. So it, it's a duty. This, the, you've made mention of the example of slick cars uh, that are being bought. I think you're making reference to, to the cars that are bought to uh, the previous speakers. First of all, the House, the Parliamentary Commission, I think, was responding to, to the law because the law has amended to make provision for these former speakers. The issue I have, and I think this matter must be debated in the commission and also have an opinion of the Attorney General of the Republic, namely, at what stage must one take a benefit of these PACs? I think it's a question of uh, interpreting the law. Can somebody take a benefit when they still have direct benefit, when they still have a lien on the public pass? That's a question that the legal minds must break down. For instance, uh, my old friend, the Right Honorable Rebecca Kadaga, a former speaker, deputy speaker, then speaker, but still a government minister, meaning that she has still access to the public pass. And therefore, she's not entirely retired. So is the Right Honorable Sekandi, who is a former vice president and a former speaker. The question is, if she's finally retired, what packs does it take? That of a former vice president, former speaker, or both? And then he's still a presidential advisor. So that therefore, he has access to the public pass. So how do you interpret the fact that one has uh, um, a double lien on the public pass? That's a matter that the law must navigate and interpret. Otherwise, if people serve the country very easily and diligently, I saw old men like uh, Professor Lugumayo, um, Ambassador, um, what's his name? Butajira. You get the feel that these are deserving senior citizens. First of all, they no longer have a lien on the public pass. I think that debate must return to the House and the law must be properly structured that it does not receive the multiplicity of interpretations. The intentions of the lawmakers must be understood by all and sundry. But secondly, probably it relates to the timing of these parks. But that's a matter. The issue of timing probably also about for how long should a person who's supposed to receive suffer? So what is the right timing? I'd rather go with the other interpretation that we have people that are recipients but still have a lien on the public pass, that is the double charge on the consolidated fund, which I think is illegal and unconstitutional. But I don't think interpreting the law is a matter for the House Speaker. That general must come out and restate the intentions of the law so that those who are deserving must deservingly get. But not to appear that there is, uh, you know, 
uh, a bonanza of sorts. That, that's my humble view. Mr. Hasif, the 40 million bribe, and then we have a new allegation of the 100 million. First of all, like I said, matters involving corruption and partaking of what is not due to you is a matter of personal probity. But political organizations where people come from have an obligation to align their members, to remind them of their duty to nation and their parties. And I think NUP should be applauded for being out to clarify where they stand. So if you're a member of NUP and the party has given a clear unequivocal instruction and you violate it, then it's a personal probity matter and therefore the, the internal uh, party mechanism should really work on you. Our position as NUP has been with clarity stated and therefore I expect nothing but compliance by my members. Um, the law could be changed. Do you think you need a, a second term? This is related to what my sister Teopista asked. Um, what the message to the new law? First of all, changing the law is an undertaking by the party. And when the party died so, it must be respected. And that cannot represent a crisis in the country or in the party. A political action taken by an institution must be to a consequence. It must be for a particular, you know, objective. And that objective should be left to the National Executive Committee of NUP to which I am a member. So when it does so, that will be NUP undertaking its duty to offering leadership. Uh, Mr. Opista, uh, if there's a new law, the advice will depend on the person and the character because people are various. If I get to know who is the one, then I'll be able to advise because I know each of my members. So I'll be able to advise depend. I don't have uh, uh, a text of advice or a, or a, a bank, a book bank. No. Advice depends on character and personality. So I'll be able to advise uh, depending on uh, the, the person that that will come. I hope I have uh, answered you. Mr. Chitata, let members you, ask their last leg of Thank questions. you. Exactly. We are going into the last leg of your questions. Honorable members and uh, members of the press, we have just a few minutes to come to the close of this. But allow me to welcome the Honorable Nyakato Asnansi, the, woman, the member of parliament for Hoima City. You are welcome. She's also our shadow minister for energy. We'd like to welcome the Honorable Katawazi Francis, the member of parliament for Kalungu West, He's Kalungu East and the Shadow Minister for East African Affairs. You are welcome. The Honorable Saz Godfrey is a member from Gumba East. You are welcome. Allow me to also welcome the Honorable Wakaima Musoke, the Member of Parliament for Nansana Municipality. Thank you for being part of this. And uh, in a special way, the President of the Uganda Parliamentary Press Association, Sam Ibanda Mugabe, is with us. Thank you so much for the support and for working with us. The last set of questions, and then we call it a day. I'm the first born to the lead of opposition. And I'm connected with the radio for OHT. In your speech, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you say that uh, in your term, at least uh, all the members of the opposition, uh, they have been managed to speak in parliament. But uh, according to we journalists who usually cover the plenary sittings and the committee. I will still see the girl. 
they are members of the opposition who has never spoke any word in a plenary, even in a committee. Uh, as we are preparing for the second term as a leader of opposition, we would like to know whether you have plan to sit with these people because I think one of your targets, uh, you want all members of opposition at least to be able to speak in parliament so that uh, the grievances of the people that you represent are worked on. My last question, it's, I'm going to ask it in Uganda because I want the response to be in Uganda. Oyogedeko ku ba minister zibo koze nabo era abantu beba deba subida nti mm, baba deba lunji. Na ye betu batu because orimu ku marilize chisanje chisoka. Kukolo bulunji osimwa. Tupade tuwa gano loku banti wa minister zo inabanji. Hata bako zebulunji. Bako zebulunji according kubetu ulira wabwebu. Abantu waga manti by the way kulembeze wu. Buyiti rivu. Na ye tuwa gano loku manya. Oyezo kutuwa yo. Ba minister zingaba stano. Oru wabu funda buo bude. Buo gamba nti ya abo. Baba deba yiti rivu mchisanja chyo. Zanyo tuwe yanziki. Thank you, right, Honorable Lead of Opposition. My name is Sam Ivanda Mugabe. I've already been introduced. I'm the president of the Uganda Parliamentary Press Association. And in that capacity, you allow me to extend our appreciation to your office and to the people you have been serving with in this 10 of two and a half years. As the UPPA, we have had a good relationship, good working relationship with you and with your people. And uh, I know you have set the agenda in that office. Believe me, what you have done will remain on record. Thank you so much. Now, let me get on the questions. One, the people who have been undermining your leadership especially when uh, performing your role of checking what government does. And the people who have been undermining your leadership, they're within the opposition and some from the party of the National Unity Platform. Well, what would be your advice to these people? Then last day, you have laid a very strong foundation, this office of the leader of the opposition. Where do you see the future of opposition in the parliament for the next two and a half years as we near 2026. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm Grace Seginia from Sort Media. My question goes to the leader of opposition. All along, uh, your demands for the human rights violations there was a meeting that we did expect it. I'm sorry if it was answered, but it's supposed to. So the biggest question is right now, the last meeting that we did expect it to be hosted by the speaker, the leader of opposition and uh, the deputy speaker, it flopped. Uh, Justice Maria Mwangadia never appeared. Even the commissioners didn't. She appeared, but the commissioners never turned up. We are heading for the festive season. This would be one of the biggest successful stories we would have registered now. What is going to be the way forward now after having this meeting flopping and what should Ugandans expect at stake? Thank you. I'm Alex Nsoboga from CBS Radio. What is your comment on this attack which happened in Gomba, especially related to ongoing land evictions, whereby we are seeing now a group of mafias hiring goons 
to protect to protect the airline is it um is it a reflection that people are no longer trusting police and other related bodies that they are now held in goons like the late Sobi? The last one. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sarah Chen Kibisi. I work with PML Daily. Uh, Honorable Op, I want to applaud you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the good work that you have done. And we as media, we are proud of you. And if wishes were true, we would wish that you come back as the LOP. You have done so well. Thank you very much. Um, now, my question is on uh, there are situations in the House where we have seen you harmonizing between the MPs' responses and the Prime Minister. There are situations where you're frustrated with the, your team, where you raise issues of national importance and you do not get a COVID, uh, a COVID response from the ministers, or sometimes even some of them dodge the House. How have you handled that? And then the Mind this final is a comment also that amidst the pressures that you've been facing as the leader of opposition, we understand the challenges are many, but we we'll want to applaud you on the way you have managed, even though some of the pressures are uncalled for. But we want to thank you for that. And personally, I want to thank Honorable Joyce for fostering a good relationship between us and your team and your honorable members for being available to us whenever we need them for issues of clarity. And finally, we pray for the grace of God to bring you back as the Lord. Thank you very much. And for your mate, that's my language. Thank you. Is that all? Thank you for the last leg of these uh, very insightful questions. Now, I want to ask uh, the, the, the shadow ministers here present, including party whips. I'm going to be very brief. And if you have something to say, and you think you must say it here, to come and use a minute and face the press here. You prepare yourself. I'm going to be brief. And if there's a shadow minister with something they want to say here, um, then uh, this is your space. I'll surrender it for you. Think about anything you want to say, including telling the media to go and hang if you, that's what you have. <laughs> now, um, my daughter Mbeji has very interesting uh, views about issues here. Um, I generalize it. And uh, from my record, all my members have said something on the floor. I've not spoken about what they said, but they said something. You get the two differently. I said they said something, meaning that none of my members is unable, is so impaired that they can hardly rise and say something. On another day, we shall discuss what. The depth of what it was about is a, a, a debate on another day. If somebody is able to speak, then that person is amenable to some direction. Then it becomes a duty of the team leader to identify their special, their unique capabilities and enable them to be able to make that capability bear on the house. I also know, for example, that um, some members are good in the committees, you see, but then maybe not as good as we would love them to be in the plenary. The plenary space is a different asking from the committee. Of course, bear in mind uh, stage flight, 
the hecklers. So the, some members may not have mastered the necessary fire as yet to be able to rise and speak with the candidness would have desired them to be. But we still have time for them to make up for those gaps. I hope there's time for these members to look at. You see, learning sometimes that's not in the classroom can be done by rural modeling. And it's partly why I encourage my members to face the media and be able to learn to respond to critical issues. The fire you face will shape you into a capability to respond to issues. And this is what I encourage my members to do. But put on the balance, I think opposition members have spoken more and more authoritative on the floor than the majority on the right over the speaker. That for me uh, is really unparalleled. And uh, I'm proud of my team. Uh, Ombeja is asking of me to rank my cabinet ministers, shadow ministers, I think it would be unfair uh, for me to do that. Uh, you, you're asking too much of me. Uh, but no doubt, because these humans must be self-motivated. Just like uh, other members of parliament, they are members who are sworn in and never turned up. There are those who are elected as shadow ministers and uh, snowed away. Um, but you see, the collective covers those gaps, which is why it's very important to sustain the collective. The collective makes up for these gaps, and we give chance. Probably these members we are given dockets that don't suit their skills, their experiences, and uh, they'll have occasion to shine uh, elsewhere. I am normally the kind that gives people a second chance. It's important that uh, because none of these um, members has a brain disability. It's probably some is motivation, it's others first stage flight and um, fail to pick up themselves. Probably some have unmet expectations. Uh, you see, like you know, you the, the public harbors a lot of expectations of members of parliament, and these members of parliament go through immense pressure to live up to public expectation. And some of this pressure, it's what has disfigured the capability to concentrate. The work of parliament needs concentration. It's a job and a full-time job at that. And the day you master that's a full-time job, then you'll be able to summon your ability and be able to make it bear upon this duty. That's my view, and uh, I hesitate to, to, to hazard any ranking of these members, but I'm very sure you people have been observant. I have seen those who have played a disappearing act, those who prefer to, to find you in the corridor and make a comment um, that will capture the headlines. <laughs> But it's, it's part of this space, and you cannot deny them that space. Mr. Ivanda, um, first of all, I also want to applaud your leadership as the, um, the leader of uh, uh, the parliamentary press team. Intricate, this space. We, the exchanges we make are what shape public opinion. And... Um, it takes sort of understanding from leaders to understand the, the critical role the media plays between what we do and the work of government. You mirror public expectations, you reflect their frustrations, the anxieties, and it helps to shape how leaders respond to this public duty. I want to thank you and your team. Where we have had a few uh, run-ins, sometimes a matter of communication, 
uh, when communication doesn't flow properly, then it can be subject to a, a number of uh, interpretations. But by and large, we have so far worked well. I hope we are able to carry on through um, that relationship. Uh, what is the fact is that even when you wake up today and I'm not alone, I am around in parliament and it's very difficult to ignore my presence in this space. So I'll be around, we shall work. I'm still around, we shall work together. People undermining my leadership, some of them in NUP, I don't know how to advise them. If they are there, maybe to ask them what is their motivation. Um, the opposition has a lot of work to do. First of all, the opposition has a duty to assure the public that it would be different if it became government. That's a huge duty that would work differently, would be better, would drive a people-driven agenda, not a personal agenda that antagonizes well-thought programs for the sake of projecting personal interest. That's a huge duty. Because we have numerical challenges, our minority alignment must be such that whoever represents the face of the opposition must be a person who works with a straightness that is expected of us. Otherwise, we don't want to lose any of us. Anyone over, every one of us matters. Secondly, we don't have the same personal skills. We don't even have the same levels of experience and education. So it follows that um, sometimes we can misunderstand each other's intentions. But when somebody boldly comes out to undermine what leaders do, probably that person has a problem. I don't know if the problem is medical, whether psychological, I can't tell. But if you give me the names, I can probably tell you because I know each of my members. If you have the confidence to give me the names. But I will tell you that um, this team has been solid. And because they've been solid, the attempt to undermine what we do has been thwarted. And uh, it's been peripheral, really. And I'm very sure those who've been trying to do it really are looked at as pariahs in this space. Where do I see the opposition in two years? The kind of opposition in the next year should be the next government. That's what I rise to do every day. And I hope it's the same view this team has. But speaking specifically, the opposition has a huge responsibility to itself first, itself, to offer hope to the country. When the opposition has fractures, has fissures, has gaps, it undermines public confidence in the opposition as being capable of galvanizing the country. But I can also understand the background. The background is that the opposition is being haunted, hunted, undermined by the ruling party using all manner of uh, available force. And that's the way, like I said earlier, puts the opposition in a very awkward position. But I think we have it to ourselves to forget our small differences and summon the common good in us and use it to present a platform over the opposition speaking with one voice. The opposition might find it necessary to work together. I hasten to add that we don't have to be bosom friends to work together. The common good should be the driving factor for us to work together. We, were never, we never grew up together, all of us. But when we find ourselves the drivers of a new national agenda as the opposition, we must therefore, as a matter of necessity, as a matter of urgency, as a matter of uh, individual probity, put aside our small interests. The small interests can be served when a common good is served. And that's my general invitation to the, whoever calls themselves the opposition. Mr. Segirinya, um, 
the meeting that never took place. The UHR commissioner never turned up. Mr. Segirinya, these issues are not dead and buried. We have spoken about them severally, and they are still alive. Yesterday, the Human Rights Commission wrote to my shadow minister for internal affairs, the Honorable John Kabdala, asking that they want to meet him to help them in their fresh investigations. Just imagine. I have been in contact with the speaker. The speaker is arranging that meeting. But in the meantime, mark that the commission is working behind, while not denying it publicly, but working behind the curtains. So these matters are alive, and we pursue them until the missing persons are produced, dead or alive. And I can tell you, if parliament sits on Christmas, it will be the first day I will rise over. If parliament sits on New Year's Day, it will be the issue. So nobody can run away with blood on their hands. And to General Museven, aware of your promise to the nation 37 years ago, you cannot remain a head of state presiding over disappearance of humans and still claim to be in charge. You cannot claim to condemn the past regimes, to condemn Idi Amin, the current system with the reincarnation, the rebirth of the Amin times probably even worse. So whatever happened during Idi Amin has been replayed by this regime. So Mr. Museveni, you have a chance to redeem your legacy by producing the missing persons and also holding those who occasioned the disappearances accountable. Have them charged for these crimes against humanity. Mr. Alex Nsubuga, the Gomba land evictions and the, the mafia show that has become the hallmark of land in this nation. I have spoken before about land matters. They are part of my record in parliament, in the statements I've authored and shared with the parliament. And I, land is not just a fact of production as we know it. Land is a tool of political control. It's the most potent tool of political control. And those who are using their power to own land at all costs are trying to control people. And they are aware that the laws of the land do not permit what they do. But because our systems have been undermined by the powers that be, the courts of law, the police, are only partially functional. The judiciary is only partly functional. Sometimes, some of the judicial decisions on land are very, most disturbing. I think you have reported about them variously. Some two days ago, I saw a profiling of uh, land fraud in this country, I think on the MBS TV, it was telling what has become of this land. So the police, I think, is on trial in these land transactions. There's a whole department in the police charged with the land. But in so many places, you find the police aiding land grabbers as against weak citizens. The country must make it very clear that land belongs to the people, not to the powerful. So land as a tool of control is being utilized, political control is being utilized. And what is going on is well known to the powers that be. There's no land grabber that is not protected by either the military in this land or the police. So meaning that land grabbing is official. I think the public needs to be aware of this and rise to the occasion and reject these overtures. Sarah says um, from the ministers and prime minister, the unresponded two questions. I think part of this is also about members of parliament. Members of parliament must have the energy to follow up on the issue they bring on the floor of parliament. 
So if you raise a matter and then you think you've just put on, on the hamster and neglect it, the members of parliament must harass ministers and the ministers resign or answer. Members of parliament have a duty to on a daily basis ask the same question until an answer is produced. And I want to encourage members of parliament to exactly do that. The same way we demand the prime minister of Chibalama, every time you see her demand from her, Chibalama. So when you have a question to a minister, please demand that that minister appears. If you have to do it every day, do it. If you ask a question and then abandon it along the way, it becomes casual and a ritual. You weaken parliamentary systems. You weaken these responses. The law cannot do all that for you. You must also have some energy to be able to follow through your questions. Sarah is, was asking about the pressure of my office. Yes, my office must have pressure because it's my, it is a consequential office. It's not an office for luxury. It's office to do work, and that work must be done. But the pressure must be positive pressure, not pressure intended to break us down and demotivate those who wake up to do good. But we try our best. We cannot run away from pressure because tomorrow um, we shall assume the role of government. So we are preparing ourselves to bear the pressure of being in a government so it is acceptable. We shall deal with those issues when they arise, as long as they're in the space we occupy. Can I ask uh, if there are ministers that have anything to say? If they're not there, then I summarize in a minute. Look, I would like to amend. Uh, please allow me to amend that. Because of time, and there are many people who came here much earlier, I would like to amend and say that uh, the media are free and allowed to interact with the shadow cabinet members after the address so that it can allow some members who came in earlier to leave. But allow me to welcome the Honorable Juliet Kakande Chikomeko, the member of parliament, woman member of parliament, Masaka City. Uh, also allow me to welcome uh, the Honorable Kabosu Moses uh, from Chamuswa. Thank you for coming. I also saw the Honorable Utamaguzi Semakula uh, from Nakaseke. Uh, thank you so much. I have seen the Honorable Patrick Nsanja from Tangeru. Thank you. Yes. The Honorable Joe Abosinja was uh, welcomed. Yeah. Thank you, Lop. You can now summarize in Luganda most of the issues that have been raised, and then the media is free to interact with the shadow cabinet members. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Joyce. I, of course, I will not be able to speak about any every each of these issues. But I'll probably uh, pick out issues uh, specifically asked of me by Mr. Paul Kayonga. They relate so many other questions that are asked. A number of uh, uh, media people here. Um, Oksoka, in Sinkaneno, Yagendere Dua. Governor Neguanga, Bitukoze, Omakagono Guise, Kuanga Kafka Kalombo Lomoka office, Yalid of opposition, Okusinkana Banamaulide, Bamsoyebi Buzo, Abeko Biatangaza, Kuereza, Weneti Muye, and no Wereza were opposition parliament, Ovuna in Zibwa, Obamu Kwasibwa, Okulem Rambane. Uh, the other Saguno, Okebaza, a Maori in Parliament, Wanga, Camera, and Mizinda, alone of your Natim Bijawi tree, Motuyambi, Octam Blanga Brium, Mwegend is a Kuchakola, Motuyambi, Okutam Buzano, Governor Neguanga, Bitukola, Eda to Trolls Anti, Echomichkoz Kuanga, Bitukola JBD, Teva Debia Chita Muruja. Um, it was a chambers dua kum kola yemirimo ya saba minister nengi yet kola gana muna ye oksoka saba minister of nine zwa we will ambiki double nji mu semateka bobanga tabu kola suboko kubanga semateka biayo gira bidala nganemu kamoi amugamba kola bidala 
kubanga emirundi minji abaka ba parliament babuziza ebibuzo saba minister tabiddam era bajukira obulonji mu mwezi gwo munana na eta mu parliament olukanga ga lwe bibuzo ebisukka makumi atano prime minister ne ba minister ba kulimbira bya bale meddu okuddam oba bibebu za buzo okuddam oyi badda mu ngeri ya kita mu rujja eranga ebyo bye bimu kubina fear omulimo gwa finger parliament ogwo kwani ka government ino kujibanje ekolo vunanzwa bwayo ateche nnaku sala minister ne parliament abera mu balirirwe nnaku zino tacha arabi kiradala kizo boko kubanga ali atuletera chibalama tumulinza amutuletere kubanga tugamba manyu wali amalaba ka mugambe ndi family ya chibalama elinzo kulya ne chibalama se kukuliyo mwaka guno atwala yali bwabanga ine ebiwundu nga bena bibwa mtu sake bisago tujja kumuyamba ko kumujjanja ba kubanga simusawo ensonga ejo kubanti office ya leader of opposition e sango kusomoza kunji e buzwe bintu binji oboli abimu yandi bade bibuzwa government ejo kitufu kubanga office eno byekola bino okujja yo ekifana nyichabo abaga lo kuchuse gwanga nenge je bagalo kola mu emirimo sina ko busa busa nti even songe zibera mu diro opposition ino buvunanyizwa okutangaze gwanga nti enkola ye emirimo je kubaya nja ulonga efunyo buyinza ebye bigwawo nensonga olusi ze bitroza nti uh, zitawe egeyangano mu opposition Ziva mubuna nzobu nene. Mubuna nzobu. Walua wabu tegele obulu nji. Walua wabu tegele kisamu samu. Haba mbalo oza. Ndi mubuna nzobu wa kweti mba mmoli. Uh, na kwela gamu bantu. Ndi mubuna nzobu wa singa kao. Ila yinsunga luwachi. Ibisira binji. Tuva yone tu kwa taka naba maulide. Tuva bulia bia tukola. Ila chiemude mbeba za. Ndi mutambo dena fe. Nga utabale guanga okusobola okwani kebyo government bya subiza njala kujukize gwanga anti government eno si ya miaka esatu eh, obebi likitundu government ya miaka asatu mmosanvu so ebiremere eh, de bidemere de miaka asatu mmosanvu ka chiri eri bana Uganda okubana esubi nti ebiremere de miaka asatu bijja kolebwa mu miaka ebiri ejijja so opposition eh, no vunanyizwa so pressure ebera mu office tujikiriza kubanga yenyonyoro bulunji obugazi no bukulu bo vunanyizibwa bwe tukola kitakiriza byabate kawa kasamba tuko mu opposition ngabina bye bayisawo ndoza obatu nafuya batuze mabega era ndoza yatugenda maso bajja kuongera okutegeera ndo vunanyizibwa bwa fegu sukka ko byetago byobuntu obwo kwetimba mmoli no kweraga mu wano we tukolera wango vuna nzwobo sibu abuntu neye buvuna nzwobo gwanga obwino kolebwa watali kutia a uh, enkolagana ya fe nebibi nebidala atene bina byo wanna chewa enkolagana eno simbi ne elimu bubezi obulumira ekisoka bino wanna chewa enako zino bitambula biwenyera ebera bibetegera Ewe rabi tudene wansi biavula. Okusoka ama teka agabi nafia. Neno okubisa kaka zito buli kisera. Okubisi muli la wadala. Echo china fuiza bituandi ya gado kwa nabiyo. Kupanga tebina kwe tengela kumala. Ngabaga lukubi gala ono okubi tisatisa. Chibina fuiza nyo. Omamuli muu. Nemi kutujia maulire. Ejiteke waka kaka zito. Obuta kola jesu wila kola Echivamu na jona jefu ndi kila na jikola yebi yangu Na jikola mwebi yangu iso uloko vera o Na urecho ufuna nza ufuna betu jina Uwebuta kiliza Aba inobu inza Okunafia No kutambuza mungeli yebi teke Ufuna nza wabu no Ibina vya wana chewa Ibina vya dini Mpapula za maulire Buli muntie na ino ufuna nza wabu Obo kule mbira abantu Chimuvuna inzibu wako kufayibu kukubira. Ukugana government ukuwambu wabu inzibu wabu antu. Nukta ambulize guanga kubira giro ibitali mateka. Mkulu wabuziza vichie bintu yabikulu. 
bitwa gara okutandi kilako omwako ogujja ngatandi ko vuna enzwa bono mu bidi abiri mugumu mu mwezi ogwo kutano echiwandi ko kinna soko kuteka mu parliament chali mu abantu ababuzibwawo ebikumi ebina mu asatu mu ababiri echiwandi kecho yebadde ntunnunsi yokuwanirira eddembe lyabantu nadala eddembe elebyo bufuzi eddembe lya maulire nebirala otogero olwalero twali tubanja abantu binasa tumba bili katubanja abantu 18 ababuzibwawo neti mwera bila nti mu binebyo abamu abatebwa batusibwa ke bisago alabafu kabalema baluberera abalala obulamu wabwe bwayo nonero wadala abantu betubanje 18 yentu nunsi yebi betu ino kola fenanga opposition na haba talimu vya abu fuzi na yu mtu wangama talimu vya abu fuzi ye avela mubichi buli mtu ye nae nache akola nga chikiza huko chusabula mubu haba mtu haba akola vya abu fuzi na ulecho buli mtu ye nae ino uvuna inziwa mungwanga uvuna inziwa uvuta andikiru wako nga semaka uvana nama kwa uvuma za dena uvuna inziwa ukuru wani ili edembele haba mtu haba abuzibu wao nukuba banja Iramba saba, muna kuzine nguze tugenda mu. Obama makanisa, makerezia, mnyimbe. Uliwe mula wa yu ina aino kubanji wa muvanji, mumuuze. Ntine ye, abantu wa gwele la bali wa wakula muzira. Abantu wa fewa banji we. Nukubanji wa wafuna njizi wa obu wa wali makumiranga tipa waza. Awakulu wa ya mu. Njabantu wa wabajia kutewa, bacha ageza wako kuhete gereza, misangu jaba gulibu wako, babu anguye. Abantu wa weta kukudairi ya makaga hawe, weta kukudairi ya abantu wa hawe, ukulaba nti, embela ya abuzi wa mtie kukubanga. Abantu ya kumi na umu na naba abuzi wa hawe. Mujju kila kachiku kama mchala wanga dia kedembe di obu ntu, kaswa hugamba nti, kawo rajibava tebali yyo. Netuko lomulimu nga office, bulimu ntu, netumu jayo ne family yena abantu be. Akachii kondo za nekewe kwa tamu vienda, wawo nekakula katia sima inche kakula, na kama zoku vila bebyo. Ela riko dizezaba ntuwabu ni family, zemu kubiwandi yiko ni video za nateka mparlamenti. No Rachel, tuwabadamu kugamba ansi, njaba ntuwabu tebali yote wama nyidua tewali obutanga avu. Obutanga avu tuwabu leta, yensonga jitu ino kutandi kila ku. Yensonga ndala, nge nongo siza mateka gebyo ukulonda, nese mateka, zilio kezi gobelele. Kubanga, nga opposition. Chidja kubacha avulave, ukuloza ntu genda genda mkulonda. Mumbera, jetuwa genda mkalua kagwa. Mumateka gega mu, ngaga kuataba mwa batigaba kuata. Masema teka yomu, gubali ya bulu obulele, ngebintu imubi ayogera, sevi ya debi rubi rubi ya bantu, nga sema teka akolewa. Emi ya kejise. Nga kudamu kubibaza, nga abama ulide, ukubela nafi, unaje tutambuli de, nitusi ya guka wanu na wali, Nga mtegeze guanga ebyo, yetuwa didu tambuza. Pebaza, ebyo takoze bulonji, tuwa subiza, tuja kuchu usamu. Wado waka sera, buli omoku higa bigi ndero wabia mune, no kuhiga, bichebi yino kolewa. Ndoza buli mtu wategeira, ugendo yetu tambula, ugendo luwamvu, Ato kumula siku tuka. Yala kubagaliza e gandalo, e dunji, ya siku kuru. Ateno kuhita mwaka. Okuingiru mwaka wa mjanga mulibala mu. Ngabuliba malirivu. Okole vyo vya takoze miyake jiwede. Okulaba antio. Kununu zibu ensi ya fe. Nubu etuwa zibu wa yu ni dembeli ya bantu ba fe. Bebe da kunchiko. Yebi kuru wabia fe. Nubu na inzo wetulimu. Mwibale nyo. Tuwe anziza nyo sebo lop. Right on about Matthias in Simpuga. Tuagala kuwebaza, banama uli mwenawa ze. Tuagala kuwebaza wakozi mwofisi ya lop. Tuagala kuwebaza wakawa parliament mwena. Neva members of a shadow cabinet. Uh, Walu wabatu se mwakasera kano nga tumaliriza. Honorable Santa Sandra Alum. Uh, woman member of parliament. Oyam. Honorable uh, Ndiwalana Christine. Bukoman Simbinoth. The Honorable Moses Okotbitek. Uh, Kioga. You're all very welcome. We are going to have uh, group photos. I think we will have four. We'll have the leader 